great to be here. I'm uh, very fortunate that I'm able to uh, coach at a place like Rymus that gives us the uh, resources to, uh, to be able to make a run like this. I mean, shoot, I've done a lot of reminiscing over the last week. As people ask me, you know, 11 years ago, I was coaching high school basketball and just getting to know the Hurley brothers pretty well. It's ironic that, you know, my first Final Four that I make, the first one Alabama makes, but I, I coaching against Danny Hurley, who his brother Bobby, it's the one that got me in this business. If it wasn't for Danny and Bobby, I wouldn't be here, and we're playing each other in Bobby's town down here in Phoenix. So it's kind of funny how it comes full circle, but, you know, be nice if I wasn't having to play against Danny's team because it's a pretty good team. So, we uh, but we, we've been underdogs uh, kind of through this tournament. Nobody expected us to be here at this point. Um, you know, last year we had the number one overall seed, and that's it, the nature of the tournament with a one game elimination tournament. The best team doesn't always win. That happened last year, and we, we've been able to make a run now, and we're going to have our team ready to go Saturday night. You know, we know we've got a daunting task in front of us, but our guys will be ready. And, you know, me and Danny talked earlier in the week. We're going to have fun. Uh, he's ultra competitive, as I'm sure you all know. And uh, not quite sure what happened with the plane. I, um, it wasn't me. I didn't send anybody over there to, uh, to mess with the uh, mechanics. I'm sure he's uh, conjured that up in his head already. But uh, he, uh, I did get a good night's sleep last night, so it's nice. Uh, but... Uh, I'm sure he'll be fired up and ready to go Saturday. It'll it'll be uh, fun, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll touch base after the game. Coach, our first question comes all the way up front on the left side of the room, Jeff. Yeah, Nate. How, how many hours of sleep did you get? I got a solid seven to eight hours in a bed, not they, not not on a plane. They got in at three thirteen. That's it's not not five. I, I am glad I'm not the ops person for the University of Connecticut basketball team during this trip, that's for sure. How do you approach this with your team? I mean, obviously nobody's picking you guys to win. Uh, you're a heavy underdog. How, how are you approaching this uh, with, with your group right now? I Listen, we were, we were an underdog. No, nobody expected us to be here. I mean, we, we, we weren't playing our best basketball coming into the regular season. Now, part of that was we, we, we weren't healthy. We haven't had uh, uh, the last time we had our, our full team healthy. We beat a really good A and M team, 100 to 75. So, you know, I, we had to sell our guys that we can make the run. You know, before the tournament, now that we've made the run to get to the Final Four, you know, I want our guys playing loose and free, but I want them thinking we got a chance to win. I mean, I mean, if you guys know me, I'm not going into this game just happy to be here. Like. I mean, UConn's great. Danny's done a great job. I mean, there's, you know, as Danny said, they're, they're bulletproof. But, they, you know, other teams have been up on them, going on runs. The, the problem is they just go on a huge run, as evidenced by the last game, 30 to 0, or and they make these enormous runs. So we're, we're going to show our guys success other teams have had. And the success that other teams have had, we, we also do those things very well. We just, we just can't give them these big runs that everybody gives up now. It's a lot easier said than done, but you know, I mean, over 40 minutes, uh, you know, we're going to be in there. We got a chance. We played some of the best teams in the country. We, we've and we we didn't win in the non-conference against some of the best teams, but we, we we had margins. You know, we were up at least six on all three of those games when we played Purdue. Creighton, Arizona, we were up at least six with at least a 75% chance of winning each game in the second half. So we've played good teams and been up on them, and we can go back to that. We just got to close out 40 minutes. Coach, we're going to go to the left side of the room by the column, AP. Hey, Coach, right here. AP Stedham, AP and Kelly, as we see at Syndicated Radio. Coach, what elements of UConn Hurley basketball are present in Alabama basketball? And in general, what do you tell your team about playing against the Supreme Shot Blocker? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the similarities are that they, they play, you know, D Danny, everybody makes it out to be like, you know, we're the, the ones doing all the analytics and efficiency. Well, Danny's 
about that stuff too. Me and Danny have talked about it. Like they, they're trying to get the most efficient shots they can too. They're trying to force inefficient shots. They do it a little differently because they've got a post player in Klingon that they can go to. You know, we, we don't play through the post as much, but we're, I mean, they, they, they like to shoot a lot of threes too. Every, every big run I've seen them make, they've made plenty of threes. They take threes in the break like we take them. You know, they, now we play a little more loose and free in the half court. Uh, they're a little more set oriented. I mean, they're going to run a set every time they don't score quickly, you know, on a, in a transition break. Our guys play a little bit more in the flow, but it's probably a lot more similarities than there are differences. And he does a good job with the sets. And obviously, attacking Klingon, well, Illinois tried to go right at him. I think they were 0, 0 for 19 on shots that Klingon contested. So it's probably not the best plan of attack, uh, but we have played against Edie, we played against Kalkbrenner, you know, we played against Jonas Adu at Tennessee, we played against some some real shot blockers and, you know, we've had some success with them, you know, can you pull them away from the rim? You know, we we can play Grant Nelson at the five some, and, you know, if he's making shots, you've got to come away from the rim, there's, there's other things you can do, but we certainly aren't going to just drive the ball at him and expect to score over the top of him all night. That, that didn't seem to work very well uh, their last game out. Just a quick reminder, you can take still photos, but no video while well in the press conference room. Let's go up to Dan, left side up front. Nate over here. Hey, Dan Wolken, USA Today. Uh, you talked about reminiscing uh, the last several days. When, when you think back to that time in your, your career and your life, were you happy being a high school coach for the rest of your career, or did you, you know, were you grinding every day to, to strive to get you know, an opportunity to do something like this? That's it's a good question. So when I when I took the job, you know, at 27, I'd been a, a Division three assistant for five years. I think I would have taken any Division one assistant job anywhere in the country. It didn't really matter it was just to be at this level. As I stayed at Romulus longer and longer, I was getting more and more picky with where I'd go. I, you know, I had three daughters that were born in uh, right outside Detroit there, and I didn't want to have to move my family. And, and, and really, the Hurley family kind of helped me come to grips in my head with, I'll be okay just being here the rest of my life. We were successful at Romulus. We were winning, you know, good retirement plan as a school teacher. You know, because I, I had interviewed at a few different schools in the MAC and didn't get them or just wasn't the right or been promised a job that then didn't, didn't come through and they had an opening and you know, I could be frustrated but I, I come to grips if Bob Hurley senior could be a Hall of Fame coach and turn down I think he had multiple division one head coaching jobs he turned down to stay at St. Anthony's and we were nowhere close to St. Anthony's at Romulus I'm not trying to compare the two programs but but the fact that he stayed at the high school level and was and everybody knew him and he was great I like I could stay here and be a very successful basketball coach and be happy with it. Well, it seems like every time you kind of get that way in life, then a pretty good opportunity comes up. So kind of when I got to the point where I, I'm we're going to work hard, but, but I wasn't just grinding to get to a college job. Let's do this the best I can because that's the way we should do it. Then I had a pretty good opportunity to come up and Bobby Hurley offered me a spot. And I got to the point I, I was not going to go into – College, if I wasn't pretty confident the guy I was going in with was going to be successful, I, I was pretty confident the Hurley family was going to be successful. Bobby Hurley being part of it, obviously, was going to be successful in his college coaching because I didn't want to have to move after getting fired year after year after year. And I've been fortunate we haven't been fired anywhere yet. Coach, we'll go to the right side, just to the left of the column. Hey, Nate, uh, David Brandt with the Associated Press. You, you talk about your background, and I, I think four out of the top five scorers on your roster transferred from mid-majors. Um, do, you, do you think that kind of player is, is a little more hungry, a little more appreciative, that there's something about you know, that journey that, that makes those players in, in some ways tougher? I think so. I feel like I'm you know, a little bit the same way. Like, I'm just a high school guy that caught a break that's still trying to prove that I even belong at this level. I think those guys are mid-major players with a chip on their shoulder that, you know, played well enough that now they get an opportunity to prove they belong at this level, and they're still trying to prove it to this day, and they're going to be trying to prove it Saturday that they belong at this level. You know, 
look at a kid like Mark Sears, who's from the state of Alabama, that we probably screwed up and didn't offer him a scholarship. There's no probably about it. We screwed up. He's obviously good enough. But I'm not sure that he would be this good if he didn't have to go to Ohio University first before he came here because he is a kid that's improved every single year. Out of high school, he had to go to Hargrave. Then he has to go to Ohio. Didn't shoot it well as a freshman. Got to prove he's a shooter. Plays well. Then we take him. You know, he ends up being our second leading scorer. Now this year he's our leading scorer and we're in the Final Four. I mean, he's just improved every year, but they all got a little chip on their shoulder. You know, Estrada from Hofstra, I mean, he's a player of the year. Back-to-back years in a great league there. But now, you know, he didn't play a ton at Oregon when he so now he's proven he can do it at this level on a team that can win and go to the Final Four and Grant Nelson and Reitzel and even Nick Pringle started at Wofford and I think only played in half the games his freshman year at Wofford. So I think all of these guys are trying to prove they belong at this level, just like I am, to be honest with you. Coach, third row on the right side. Coach Ryan Hennessy, NBC 13 in Birmingham. There's a stat that came out that over the last few years, the Final Four coaches have an average of 20 years of experience as a head coach. I believe yours is nine in Division One. How many people have said to you, you can't do it this way? Your, your route was a little different, not being an assistant for long. And what do you say to those people that there is different routes to take to get to the Final Four? Yeah, there's definitely a different route. Mine's a lot different than most. You know, and I was at Romulus. And, you know, Danny being at St. Benedict's, Kevin being at Hargrave, and Romulus a little bit different. It's cool that we were all in high school. Mine was a little more like the traditional high school. You actually had to live in Romulus to go to Romulus. And I, I think it gives some hope and belief for just the normal high school coach out there, you know, maybe not the high school coach that's on this national level where they're recruiting nationally. You know, but I, I think, and I wouldn't trade my route for anything because I, I got experience at, at that in different ways that, that like a lot of these coaches don't get. If you haven't coached at a high school level, you have no idea what it's like to be on the other side of the recruiting table. You know, I, I had 18 kids go play Division One. I, I took a lot of them on visits. I, I took E.C. Matthews on an unofficial visit to Rhode Island, drove them out there from Detroit to Rhode Island, sat in on all the meetings. I know what it's like to sit on that side of it, so I can use that to apply. And there's lots of I'm able to experiment with how I play if your first head coaching job ever is at Division One level, there's a big spotlight on you. you. You can't experiment as much. You know, one year we pressed the whole year, found out what worked, didn't work. You know, like, if you do that at this level and it doesn't work, you may get fired after a year. Like, you can, if they fire me from being a coach at Ramos, it, it only takes like $4,000 out of my, I'm still, I'm still good as a teacher. I still got my math job. You know, so I was able to experiment a little bit more. You know, uh, coming up that way, and I think it, it gives me a different perspective on some things. But I'm here. I, to those that say you can't do it, I, I, it, it's definitely harder. But you can't do it. I, I just did it. I mean, you got to catch some breaks. I don't want to, you know, if I had some secret formula, I'd write a book and make millions retire from coaching. You, you got to catch a lot of breaks, but you got to be ready for your breaks when when they're given to you too. Like so. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm thankful to be here. I was grateful to work at Buffalo under an AD that took a chance. He's now in the SEC. Danny White's at Tennessee, but he gave me a job after only being there for two years. I, I, you know, I was only out of high school for two years. So I, I know that I'm fortunate. I work for different people, caught different breaks that a lot of people don't get. There's a lot of high school coaches that are probably just as good, if not better than me, and just haven't had a break like I've, I've been able to have. All the way back and all the way to the right side. Coach Sam Lance with Adams Gory and Zagsblog.com. First thing, what made you want to recruit Aaron Estrada, and how does NIL help someone like him kind of change he and his mom's life? He talked to us about how much NIL has allowed him to support her. Yeah, I mean, Aaron's an unbelievable kid, a great player. I coached at a level similar to what the CAA is, the MAC and the CAA are similar levels. and. When I got the job at Alabama, I know there's the best player in the MAC could definitely have played for us at Alabama for sure, just about every year. So you go find a player of the year on back-to-back years in a league as good as the CAA, 
like we knew, and we, we've got a third-party analytics company that helps us kind of evaluate transfers on fit within our program, and they they thought he was great. I mean, he's like the best guard in the portal that, that we could get for how we want to play, and he's proven to be pretty good. I mean, he's got a triple-double. I mean, you think about all the pros we've had since we've been at Alabama. It's only the second triple-double we've had. Kyra Lewis had the first one, so he's played great. As far as the NIL goes, you know, you know, you go from Hofstra to a place like Alabama, and there's opportunities for a lot of um, a lot more NIL than there was at Hofstra. You know, for him to be able to bring his mother down to as many games as they did and help her. You know, I did an in-home visit with him in a Philly area, him and his mom, and you know, I, it kind of took me back to my Romulus days. Like I said, I you know, I used to go to all my players' houses and stuff, and I'm in a uh, – it, it, it was cool to kind of be in there and know that he could support his mom. And I mean, she's a great lady. I lo- love seeing her at all the games and she's super nice, but yeah, he's able to help her with what, what he can and bring her to games. And, you know, the NCAA is great. They provide the money to bring the families to the final four, but now with NIL, like the kids can bring their parents to all the NCAA tournament games, Spokane, LA, they can t- fly them up to Toronto when we play Purdue. They can, it, it, so those opportunities are great for the kids now. Up front and center. Nick Kelly, the exclusive news. Nate, can you put into words what Mark Sears has meant to the team's success in the tournament and the whole season? Well, obviously, he's our leading scorer, and um, you know we had a top five offense in the country most of the year. A lot, a lot of the year, we were number one offense in the country, and he's a huge part of that. We wouldn't be where we're at without him. We know that. Um, and offensively, he's been one of the best players in the country all year. We would not be in the Final Four if it was not for Mark. Sears defense leadership like he's turned it turned it around a lot in that regard in the last month I, I think he made a decision he wants to play as long as possible this year wants to put himself on a national stage and the only way we were going to do that is if our best player was really locked into the defensive end of the floor and he's been really locked in and proved he can be a, a great guard defender and and he's doing it. We need him to do it on Saturday night again because, you know, he's got to play. He's it's our best player on offense. He's going to play a lot of minutes. So when your best player is playing really hard on defense and leading the way he's been for these last few weeks, you got a chance to make a special run like we've done. Coach, center of the room, three rows from the back. Robert O'Connell, Wall Street Journal. Nate, you've talked all tournament about this philosophy of next, next, next. Can you expand a bit on the different things that might mean to you on the practice level, game level, season level, and how hard is it to kind of trust that process in, like you say, a single elimination tournament where yeah. things can go off the rails so quickly? Yeah, so, you know, I talked to Coach Saban um, after we lost in the SEC tournament. You know, I think just about every year he won a national championship, they lost at some point during the year. And football's obviously different. You know, there's a lot more games in basketball. But, like, this year they lost the, the Texas game, and he did an unbelievable job getting the season turned around. So I called him, like, how, how do we get this thing turned around this late? Like, we haven't – we're not playing our best basketball. And he kind of talked – he watches all the games. And, Coach, you got to get you guys – they got to go to the next play. And we kind of talked about that a little bit as a group. But I'm like, you know what, we're going to make this real simple. We're going to come in we're just next – like, and it goes all kinds of different ways. Sometimes we'll be on, like we've had, like I said, we had the number one offense for a bulk of this year, this year, until we got, the injuries came. But sometimes we'd be on a big run, be up on a team big, and we just relax on defense. It even happened to us in the NCAA tournament. We got up 31 on Charleston. I felt like we relaxed, and over the last seven minutes, they outscored us by 18. So we, we did a pretty good job of next until then, and then we didn't do a good job at it. But it, it's also been the other way. You know, we, we have some offensive struggles. Guys will drop their heads, and they're thinking about the last play on offense instead of the next play on defense. So, you know, we just – it's the next action within the play. It's the next play no matter what happens on offense, good or bad. Bad call by a referee. Teammate misses you on an open kick out. It doesn't matter. Just go to the next play and give everything you have to the next play. And then when we're done with this game, move to the next game. So – I think it's great philosophy in life. There's a lot of adversity you hit in life. Move to the next, what's the next best action? Like, shoot, go through all kinds of things in life. Move to the next one and make that the, the best one. By, you live in the past, 
you're not going to be very good in the present. So we, we've been trying to move to the next play, the next action, the next timeout, just next, next, next. And our guys have been doing a pretty good job at it for four games. Coach, this is likely our last question. And Reed, we're using that same back right mic. Matt. Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. Nate, this is kind of touching on what you just talked about, but you're 105th in adjusted defensive efficiency at Ken Palm, which I know you know. At this stage of the season, your team's defensive capability or lack thereof kind of is what it is. When you face UConn as a coach and at, with your staff, are you going to lean in on everything possible that you have offensively, knowing that you have certain limitations defensively and what the data says, and, and I know you're deep into that, or how do you prepare this team after seeing UConn essentially, you know, eviscerate his past four tournament so, opponents? So, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we, we've got a third-party analytics company that does a great job. We look at Ken Palm a lot. We look at Bart Torvik. We, uh, we look at all of them a little bit here and there. I think Bart Torvik's got one that you can put in just a set number of games. So if you look at our four games in the NCAA tournament, we're not anywhere close to 105. Do you know what we are? Yeah, you should look at just the tournament. And if you looked at the four games in the tournament and took apart, the, look, we did a very bad job once we got up 31 on Charleston. We relaxed. If you take out those seven minutes where they outscored us by 18 after we got up 31, our defense, and, and, and you could probably do it, do it. I, I should ask our third-party analytics company, SSA, to, to do it for me. I, I believe our defense is more like top 30. So I, I don't, we're not going to just assume that we're a, a terrible defensive team and just try to outscore UConn. I think that's a recipe for disaster. They're too good on both sides of the ball. I, I will say we, we basically, our, our mindset with these guys have been guys, if, we can have, if we're back healthy and have the number one offense in the country like we had when we were healthy and we can be a top 20 to 30 defense, we can make a Final Four run. So forget it. We're not fixing the 105. I mean, there's not enough games left. to. But let's forget that. Let's lock in. We're going to do everything we can in these games. So uh, we did give our guys after the first week of the tournament in the last two games, we were whatever it was, 30-something, I think it was. So... I haven't run it yet. I've been a little bit too busy trying to figure out UConn. Uh, we've got our hands full with UConn. You could probably run it quick, and I, I should have had it run. But I, we're not – our offense has to be great. We know that against a very good defense from UConn. But we are going to try to be as good as we can possibly be on defense. I just don't think you can try to be UConn 120 to 118. That's probably not going to be a good idea. That's unfortunately all the time we have with Coach Oates. Fortunately or unfortunately, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Coach. We'll see you back here tomorrow Thanks. afternoon. Thanks. Appreciate you guys. Roll Tide.